Okay, so post-processing operations in practice. Let's get right to it. So uh, there's a few interesting points to make uh, in this lecture. Uh, we're going to talk about general systems. We're going to talk about the lack of consistency when it comes to exposure indicator in that manufacturers call them by all sorts of different names and they all have different ranges. Uh, we'll also talk about one way to try to standardize that. So across the board, everyone's using the same thing. Uh, we'll talk about speed class and what that means in terms of how it relates to spatial resolution or resolution overall compared to exposure. So a few things to talk about, uh, including what happens when you use an extreme overexposure, which is what we were trying to do here in the lab and we'll eventually uh, try again. So let's just start with stuff that you kind of already know and now that you've been in clinic have probably seen, everyone's using different CR plate readers. Anyone use anything that looks like this one here? This is a Kodak. Uh, they all basically have the same function internally, right? Uh, you'll learn about this uh, in a week or two uh, for when we have a lecture about CRDR technology, uh, but there is a laser inside of, of these units, of the plate reader units, that will take your PSP, your photostimulable phosphors, which are inside all of these cassettes, uh, and will sweep across them uh, and add energy into the system so that a light pops out. More on that in a couple of weeks. But how they get to that point varies. So for example, here you have your PSP, the phosphor inside, slides out and kind of goes, sucks into this machine here. Um, our Konica over here uh, takes the whole cassette. Point is they all have a lot of the same similarities. Um, they all have ways that they could be accessed by um, different uh, technicians to come in and fix the machines and update them and, and give you uh, new algorithms perhaps uh, that we can't get into and change. But there's a lot of things we can do right? You're probably used to uh, a screen that you can see your image and you can flip it or change the windowing in terms of contrast. You can change the brightness in terms of changing your level. There's usually some type of button that you can press to accept the image or reject the image. I know on our Konica, if you want to reject the image, uh, the button is there, but it's kind of hard to see on purpose so that you don't actually click it and delete something that you didn't want to delete, right? It's not always as bold as what this screen makes it look like. Uh, there should be other areas where you can flip your image if it shows up like this. And you might be able to do some operations besides changing contrast and brightness. You might be able to uh, adjust the magnification and do operations that we talked about last week, things like edge enhancement, uh, things like smoothing the image. One thing I want to bring out is that when you make some of these changes to the contrast or to the image in general, and then send it into packs, you may not be able to reverse those later on down the line. And in addition, you may limit the radiologists from doing their own operations. Right? So uh, we create or we work with the raw data. But once it leaves the plate reader and is sent into packs, of course, in this room, it's only, you know, a foot and a half. But uh, when you send it there, they now have image data that they can then still manipulate. Uh, however, you might be taking some of their latitude away when you decide to, you know, fix the contrast yourself. So um, speed class is a term that historically was based on film screen technology. So that's why we say historic, because we're no longer using screen film. It's mostly digital out there. There might be someone somewhere still using film. And it talks about the relationship between the exposure and the amount of radiation that the patient gets. So when I say exposure, I mean your mass. Uh, and there's also a relationship to the overall image resolution. So the way speed class works uh, was an arbitrary number, you can read more about this in your textbook, was created. So they came up with this number, 100 is what they started with. And they said, 
for this film to be given a speed of 100, so it was based on the actual film emulsion, it would require an exposure of 2 millirem in order to produce a density, so an area of blackness, as read out by a densitometer, which we don't we have here, but we don't really use it because we're not doing anything with film. But a 100 speed film system would give you a density of 2.5 as read out by a densitometer with an exposure of 2 millirem. And that was said to give you, you know, a fairly diagnostic image. However, it works with multiples of 100. And if you were to increase the speed, so if you were to go from 100 to 200 speed, you could then use half the amount of radiation. So notice we're going from 2 MR down to 1 MR and still get the same density. You could take that to the next level, go down to, uh, excuse me, go up in speed to 400, which would allow you to reduce the radiation down to just 0.5 millirem and still get that same density. So you might ask yourself, why not have these films all set to the highest speed possible so that we could use the lowest radiation possible? I mean, that's my first thought. And this is where the trade-in comes, or the trade-off, right? For a lower radiation level, you get worse quality. Your image resolution goes down. So in the film world, it was directly related to spatial resolution, right? Your spatial resolution would go down, uh, but you were able to lower your exposure. In CR and DR, even though this was an old film term, they still have this term known as speed class, but it takes on a little bit of a different you know, scenario. It's still related to the amount of radiation and it's still proportional, right? If you use a faster speed, sometimes known as the sensitivity of the system, you could then uh, use less radiation, but what actually happens is it will affect how that phosphor is read out within the machine. So there is a change in how fast the laser goes across the stimulable phosphor. And by the way, the reason why it's called a, a photostimulable phosphor is by shooting photons at it, light photons in the form of laser light, it will stimulate that phosphor to give off light which is then captured uh, and quantified by the system. You learn all about that in a couple of weeks. However, we still use this term. And instead of setting the machines at 100, they are set up at a 200 speed class. And you can change this. We're going to do a lab within the lab to see how much of a difference it actually makes. But you might have noticed that um, just before you process, there's a couple buttons that say like standard processing and high resolution or something to that effect. Now I can't remember what it is. What's it called? Uh, I don't know. Someone set this up as if they were going to do anything. Set up for a hand. Yeah. I just want to know what the term is, right? So by uh, adjusting that parameter there, you're actually changing the speed class, which if you increase the speed, it'll allow you to use proportionally less radiation. However, the image quality will go down. And that's what we want to assess when we do a lab within the lab. What do those two buttons say on the top right? Standard and... No, the two buttons on the right, standard and high. So those are our, our differences. So if we process that using a high, uh, I think what it'll do is it'll actually slow the system down, allow you to gather more data, and then overall give you a better image. <clears throat> 
So I don't want to drone on and on about the exposure indicator because we've talked about this enough times. But part of our discussion today is, you know, is there a way to come up with something that is not so all over the place, right? Now, if you're talking to your fellow student and uh, if you're using different plate readers out there, chances are you're using different exposure uh, indicator terms, right? Exposure indicators is a generic term, but everyone uses, you know, different actual terms. And then they also use different actual um, ranges for those numbers. And those ranges in turn are based on the speed class that the system is set up on. So that's part of where this ties into. Uh, so let's get past some of this because we've talked about where your exposure indicator comes from. We, we talked about the fact that it's based on your lookup table, which in turn, you know, created S min and S maxes based on different thresholds and all of that we've talked about. Um, and we've discussed some of these guidelines, right? Um, probably the biggest one is number one. Um, this is, goes for DR as well as CR. And that if we don't have enough exposure, right? In other words, a low exposure, not necessarily a low exposure indicator because in CR it's the opposite, right? When the number's high, that's when you had had a lower exposure. Um, we've learned that we would get noise in our system. Right. And that you could recognize. But an overexposure uh, is hard to figure out. Right. Because when you look at the image, it looks good. Even when you use 10 times the amount that you should have used, uh, unless you have a very excessively high exposure leading to what's known as saturation. And I'll try to show you what that looks like. Only then will you get a visceral, uh, visible cue that causes you to step back and say, wow, we overexposed the patient, no good, right? But chances are you don't see that because you have to be way, way off, right? So for example, if you did a hand at two mass and it looks good, that's fine. If you do a hand at 20 mass, that's also gonna look good. You probably have to do the hand at around 200 mass before you actually see a noticeable difference in the actual image. But before you ever get to that, let's go back to the 20 mass, which is still a considerable overexposure, right? You know, 10 times what you should have used. The only way to see it, in quotes, right, is by your exposure indicator, right? Otherwise it looks good. Do we repeat it? Usually no, right? Uh, usually we don't repeat if the image looks good even if the exposure indicator is off. But it, you know, it really depends. And usually the only time you would repeat is if the overexposure, I'm sorry, not overexposure, if the exposure indicator was off with a lower exposure than you wanted, because that'll give you noise and it doesn't get fixed as easily. So here's an example of all these different manufacturers that are using all sorts of different terms. Konica is down at the bottom, so the exposure indicator for Konica is known as an S number. At least Kodak calls it an exposure indicator, except they call it an index. Canon has a, a Rex number. Uh, Agfa has, has an LGM number. Uh, and what makes these difficult is they also have different ranges. Take a look here. Uh, an ideal exposure for Agfa is a number around 2.5, but for Kodak, it's a number around 2,000. This is no good, especially if you have like three part-time jobs, right? I mean, you better keep some notes in your back pocket, right? Or else you're never going to be able to figure it out. So, and this is at a 200 speed class, right? If the sensitivity of the system is altered, like we just described, that would change these numbers again. So, I mean, you might work with a Konica operating at 200 speed class and then go on your part-time job and for some reason they changed the class and didn't go with the default. It's all over the place, if, if you get my point. So what if we could standardize this? What if we could create, you know, a, a standard? I'll come to repeating images in a second. What if you could create a term that goes across all of the manufacturers 
so that on your many, many part-time positions and jobs, it's just one number to memorize or one group of numbers at least. That would make life easier. That's a standard. Right. Standards are very useful because everyone, you know, plays in the same sandbox. It's not confusing. Right. It's like uh, the standard for medical images is DICOM. The standard for a lot of photographs that you take with your phone is, is a JPEG. Right. Um, there are standards so that the DVD that you buy or purchase that you play in a DVD player in one person's house that has a Sony versus another person's house that has a Fuji, it works unless you go out of the country. And that's where the standard might fall apart. So it helps to standardize things. So the deviation index is an attempt to do that. Of course, the manufacturers have to get on board because they have to put out a DI number every time the exposure pops up. And it means that internally, it might still work with whatever its version of the exposure indicator is and then convert that to a DI so that everyone knows what we're talking about. So what does the DI actually look like? It's on the left column and it's not that complex. Uh, and you'll see the relationships in just a second. So let me go over this with you because I want you to know this stuff. But it's only half as much as you think you need to know. You really only need to know three things. All right. So one, anything over three is way too much exposure, right? But of course we don't repeat usually because the images still look good. Now we're gonna skip around a little bit for, for good reason, I think. Anything lower than a negative three, so notice we went from positive three to negative three. Anything lower than a negative three is a huge excessive underexposure. That's definitely a repeat. Now, let's talk about over and underexposure, but not excessive. So it's kind of like middle ground. So still an overexposure is plus one to plus three. I, uh, a underexposure, did I say underexposure? Yeah, overexposure plus, plus one to plus three underexposure negative one to negative three. So it's not as much to memorize as you might think. We're just kind of playing with the negative numbers. So what is the target range? What is something that makes you happy? Well, when you think about it, it's the only one that's not whole numbers, right? It's negative 0.5 up to positive 0.5. If that number pops up after your exposure, that's our target, right? It's neither an overexposure or an underexposure. That would then thus be a properly exposed image. Wouldn't it be nice? You just memorize these few numbers, not that many, and then you can have 12 part-time jobs. Right now, not only is it all over the place, but sometimes the ranges are different even based on the body part. So in our lab, from a finger to a femur, it's 150 to 250, right? But in another place, you might have a separate range, even on the same machine, for an abdomen versus extremities. Has anyone seen anything like that? A lot of times they have to post this stuff on the wall because it's kind of impossible to remember everything. Uh, now, the DI, though, would really be nice, right? If, again, all the manufacturers could get on the bandwagon. Um, and to create the standard that everyone could use instead of it being all over the place. Overall, though, when it comes to repeating an image, because of the wide latitude that you have in CR and DR, it shouldn't be technique, right? Unless you have an incredibly high exposure, you're not going to get saturation leading to a repeat. And again, I'll show you what that looks like. And uh, often enough, because of what's known as radiation creep, you're not going to get an underexposure because people are likely to use more than they ever needed to begin with in the first place. Right? The whole selling point of digital radiography, at least one of the main selling points, was that you could lower the radiation to people, which is why 
uh, things became a little bit devious when the manufacturers went out there and installed these units and administrators would say, so what happens to our techniques? Do we need to change our KV? Do we use a certain percentage of mass that's different than before? They, a lot of them would just say, no, you don't. Whatever you have works because they knew that the consoles were already set up for film screen and that those techniques are higher than you need to use in digital imaging. So no need to adjust your APRs, your pre-programmed techniques. We didn't do that here either, right? For a hand, when you set it up, you know, it probably says something like 52 KV. I don't know what the default might be, but as we've discussed, you can use higher KV and lower mass, but you have to go in and program the system to do that. So what is gonna be our likelihood for repeating? It's due to what? Well, okay, from a technique standpoint, but I mean an overall standpoint, it's not technique at all anymore, right? It's positioning and alignment or, you know, catastrophic events like the tube breaking or maybe an artifact that you didn't see that causes a repeat. Like, I know I've done this. I'll be the first to admit. I've taken a chest x-ray and left that person's chain on. It happens. Has that happened to you already? Yeah. Oh, that'll do it. Did you get yelled at? Don't do it 12 more times. Well, cool. I don't have pockets in my underwear. Um, too much information. So yeah, I, that's an easy one to miss. I mean, who thinks of that? And you know, I, I actually, honestly, I don't remember saying to anyone, oh yeah, don't forget to not put anything in the pocket of your underwear if you happen to have one. Um, it's usually just undressed from the you know waist up or whatever. Um, so yeah, that, that can happen. Um, here's one for you. I have a question. So when does a penny become a foreign object and when is a penny a, uh, I'm sorry, foreign body and when is it an artifact? So yeah, if someone swallows it, then it's a foreign body, right? Uh, if someone leaves it on the table and you just radiograph it and they lay it on top of it, then of course it's an artifact. All right, so technique, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, you know, for teaching wise, uh, it's not as critical other than, you know, saving exposure to the patient. Uh, we're hopefully not getting repeats because we're using excessive or way too little radiation, right? Repeats are coming from positioning and alignment, uh, et cetera. But hopefully, at least in terms of our exposure, if we all switch to a, di a deviation index number, right, um, it would make life so much easier for people. Question, what's there between uh, 0.5 and 1? Does our range not cover? Yeah. Like 0.6? Um, percentage to like Yeah, that's a good question. I guess that would be somewhere in between these two, right? Like 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 before you actually get. So that's probably, you know, um, probably still okay. I guess it would be, especially since this says negative 20 to 25, I guess it leaves some, you know, margin where the numbers are, you know, completely exact. But yeah, that's a good point. Uh, but if you did get a 0.6 or 0.7, uh, again, you wouldn't be repeating. So is it possible to use too much and have it affect the image? Yes, but you have to use an awful lot. So I won't take the time to do this, but we could do it in the lab. What I've had people do is 
Uh, and the reason why these are wrong is because um, one of the students who I had do this misinterpreted what I said. Uh, I had I wanted them to keep doubling the mass, but instead they kept doubling the MA station, which actually gave us the same exposure because every time they doubled the MA, the time went down by half <laughs> in the background, right? So the exposure ended up being the same, right? I even got confused because I so wanted it to change. I, I looked at the last one, I'm like, it looks like there's a little difference there. And, okay, but uh, when you do saturate it, we're not talking about using 10 or 20 times the mass. We're talking about using 50 times the mass, right? We're talking about using uh, 150 mass on a hand instead of using two and a half, right? And what will happen is probably more complicated than we ever need to know. But essentially the Dells get confused and uh, their information gets skewed and half of them probably turn off or turn black. And you get an image that is just extremely dark, right? Uh, we did one last week where you could barely tell that the hand was there uh, if it wasn't for like the wrist bones at the bottom, right? All the radius. So eventually we'll try to duplicate that and, you know, maybe take a picture of it and put it on our department Instagram account, which we don't have. Um, maybe we need one. But this is really hard to do unless you, you know, miss one or two decimal points, right? Especially if you're setting time. You know, if, if you went for... 0.2 seconds, but instead you had two seconds, right? That might do it. And there's no fixing this, right? Um, you can even try windowing and leveling it to try to lighten it up. It doesn't work anymore at that point. But this is really tough to do, right? To actually saturate the image, it's tough. Uh, what are some possible errors that could still happen uh, things that we've talked a little bit about already, right? If you have uh, sort of extraneous exposure information, which I guess the only thing that really falls into that would be scatter, maybe leaving your cassettes in the room uh, in between exposures, which is never something you should do. But how many techs do that all the time? They have three images to do. They bring all three cassettes. They put three of them down on the table and they take one, move it over here and do what they need to do. Go out, make the exposure, come back. They don't have to take cassettes in because they were trying to save time or they didn't want to lift things a third time. Uh, but that's not really recommended because the CR cassettes are very sensitive to scatter. So maybe that'll throw off your exposure indicator, right? Or if you take too long uh, to process, so I skipped from the top down to the bottom. So if there's a delay in processing, and that's what Jody Ann uh, was doing. Uh, we had a lab within the lab last week. Yeah, it's not there anymore. And we wanted to see what happened when you, one, opened up the cassette and exposed it to light uh, briefly, two, waited uh, three days to process, and four, waited a whole week to process, which would have been this morning. And I'm looking forward to seeing what the results of that are. But those will certainly throw off the exposure indicators if they don't erase the image completely. Another thing you'll learn about uh, in a couple of weeks from me, but not indirectly. It's actually, I've already pre-recorded that lecture for you. Uh, so definitely come, even when you hear that we're going on a conference, I'll be there with you while I'm driving upstate. Uh, but we'll learn the way that you, ex to actually erase, it's basically the last CR process, the last step is that the, it, the phosphor is exposed to a very bright light, right? To, to kind of reset all of the molecules within the phosphor, right? But we're trying to somewhat duplicate that um, by just taking a long time to process the image because ultimately the lights here will erase parts of the image. So we'll see what Jody Ann gives us soon. <clears throat> Maybe we'll know today. So exposure field recognition error. So in other words, we talked about this is one of the first steps that occurs, right, in the system, when we're looking to see where the collimation is, right? And, and also things like uh, unexpected material in the field, in other words, maybe a piece of a lead apron uh, or a prosthesis, all those kind of things can throw off our exposure indicators.
Uh, another thing that will definitely change our numbers and change the appearance of the image, sometimes for the better, we've talked about this, we even had a lab related to this, right? Uh, when we took a what chest x-ray and processed it as a foot and a, a skull. Uh, so if you're using different procedural algorithms, you're gonna get different numbers. Again, sometimes the results are, are good. And honestly, if they're good, you shouldn't just change them, but if you have a staff meeting, that might be something to, to bring up. You know, uh, maybe they'll go in and make an adjustment and, and uh, make your foot protocol similar to your T-spine protocol, or whatever it might be, and call it what works, if that seems to work. Right? These things are constantly changing, right? I gave the example in the last class that um, our unit didn't change, but it went from like a version two software and skipped and went to version four. And instead of having one button, which I have to say made things easier for hand, forearm, elbow, wrist, uh, now we have separate procedural algorithms, probably pinpointing uh, to make each image just a little bit better, right? Then, you know, one upper extremity button. That's what we used to have. You know, we had like a little stick figure kind of guy. And if you wanted, if you did a wrist or a hand or an elbow, you press the same like arm. And that was it. Uh, here's an example. Again, you know, it's hard to say which one's better, which one's worse. The one uh, A, and you know what, when I look at this, I still have to read the bottom. Because it's even hard for me to tell that A was a normal cervical spine algorithm and B, they used an abdomen. I guess the one on the right is a little bit dark. Uh, the spinous processes, you know, these parts back in here are, you know, a little bit harder to see. They're darker. But otherwise, you know, if I walked in and just saw this one image on the screen, I might be, okay, not too bad. Probably lighten it up anyway right? With your level. So uh, windowing and leveling are, are really great tools. Uh, again, just remember what we do, the radiologists may not be able to do as easily if we've already kind of messed with the contrast, right? Because we've changed the raw data. We've turned it into image data, right? Which they may no longer be able to access the raw data especially after a certain amount of time goes by. In our lab, I'm not worried about our plate reader running out of memory, but in a regular hospital, you know, what they do in two weeks, we probably don't do in a year of actual exposures, maybe even a week, right? Um, where they're taking hundreds of exposures. That being said, memory is not infinite. Um, so, occasionally you start to lose information, right? Remember, it's, these things have already gone to pass. I'm talking about the raw data. So once that raw data is purged to make room for new raw data, new procedures, it's gone, you know, unless they decide to keep it and, and back it up somewhere, which is possible, right? But data is expensive and storage is expensive. And think about this too. We don't have this here, and hopefully I don't jinx myself, but if the ceiling tile comes down with a flood of water and destroys everything in that system, well, could you imagine if that happened in real life and you lost you know, thousands of people's data? Not too good, right? So there's redundancy built into all of these systems in that there's a backup that almost takes up as much memory as the original. There's some compression involved, so you save maybe a little bit of of memory, but are you getting, you know, the hint that extensive memory uses, right? We're no longer talking about megabytes. We're not talking about gigabytes. We're not talking about terabytes, which might be your external hard drives that you buy to keep your movies on. You know, we're probably talking about pentabytes, which is like the next level, you know, so it, it gets expensive for a hospital, All right? But what would we do without windowing and leveling? What? Try to get the technique right the first time. Yeah. Um, that's right. But even if you're a super tech, um, you just can't be super every time. You know, you'll get cases where things are difficult and don't always work out as you'd like. 
even the most seasoned technologists. And, and sometimes, you know, we're working with equipment, doesn't always work perfectly. So to a lower extent, right, we have smoothing and edge enhancement. And when I say lower extent, it's typically nothing that we generally do in our day to day. This is more of a radiologist type of routine. But we've talked uh, enough about this last week, right? These are other operations that can be performed um, on images, right? Here's an example of uh, an edge enhanced or, or a smooth image. So if you if you look here, I mean, you could look at other areas, but this is where I notice it the most. Uh, you have a lot more detail on A than you do on B. All right, it looks a little bit smoother over here. And uh, someone asked a good question uh, in the last class. So which one's better, Professor Lobel? Um, neither of them are better, right? It all depends on what your diagnosis is. And do you feel the need to use edge enhancement or, or smooth the image? Usually you wouldn't smooth an image unless it was noisy to begin with, right? The other thing to keep in mind, um, I make jokes about this, but the radiologist monitors are expensive and they have a lot of capabilities. You can see multiple windows. You can have the original image, a smoother image, and an edge enhanced image, you know, all next to each other. It's not one or, and then you can never go back, right? You maybe can't go back to the raw data that I talked about, but you still have the image data that you can do a lot with. And it's that image data that's kept uh, on file, so to speak, for what do you learn in, in patient care? Is it seven years before x-rays can be destroyed? But now we don't talk about, you know, sheets of film being sent off to some, you know, warehouse somewhere. You know, now we're talking about how long do you keep the digital data, right? It does get confusing too, uh, because in CAT scan MRI, where you create some of these fancy images, which creates even more data, right? I think I mentioned that last week. When you want to create, you know, some 3D images, you have to make another data set, right? And when you want to do other fancy things, you create another data set. So you keep multiplying the original exposure data to give you more data, which means you have more to save and more memory that you need to use. So it compounds on each other. But, you know, radiologists, they have the ability to look at multiple images and go back at least to the basic image data. And in some cases, the raw data, maybe if it's still available. So I don't know which one's better. I like, I would generally go with the one that's edge enhanced. It shows better spatial resolution, as long as it's not too pixelated to where you, if it's too noisy and you can't make a diagnosis, well, then that's not good. Um, masking or dark masking, which is also known as shuttering, and I don't even know if that term appears in your book, but um, is a, a technique mostly for radiologists. And what it does is it takes the collimation on an image and gets rid of it. Does it really get rid of it? So you see this nice big white border on that hand x-ray? So Professor Ingracia, really anyone, would say this is great evidence of radiation protection. So where does masking, dark masking come in? Well, if you're a radiologist, if you're looking at these all day, your eyes will get fatigued, right? They've done studies that have found that if we take this border and turn it off so it's just black and kind of blends in with the rest of the information, it's easier on eye fatigue. Right? I mean, after all, they're looking at hundreds of images a day, if not more. Um, so shuttering, I like that term because you think of shuttering on a window. So we're kind of not removing the collimation. I mean, you collimated at the time of the exposure. You did your due diligence. Um, so shuttering is one of the first things I look for because sometimes it happens automatically when it comes up on screen. I don't know if you've seen that in your hospitals. The first thing I do is learn how to turn it off to see if the student actually collimated. Right? 
And then we can turn it back on to make life easier uh, on the eyes for the radiologists. Right. By the way, that would be what type of processing um, that we discussed a week or two weeks ago? What domain does that come under? You guys remember? You said the two, the answer is the one you didn't say. So she said spatial and she said frequency. What's the one she didn't say? The intensity domain. Well, think about it. What is it doing? It's analyzing the intensity of the pixels, which are all pretty bright. I'm sure there's, you know, a range uh, within that, right? Um, and the computer says, turn those off, make them black. And there you go. Uh, image reversal or, or black bone. Uh, I think I'm going to take off the term subtraction here. Um, in my mind, subtraction is more of a removing of something. You subtract something away from the image, like taking the ribs out of the chest x-ray that we saw the other day. Uh, that's more of a subtraction. This is more of uh, another intensity domain, right? This is analyze the intensity of every pixel, not just the ones in the collimation like we just talked about, and reverse it to its opposite grayscale. Uh, we can do that over here, right? We have a little button that just says invert, and there you go. Notice it looks like shutter because it kind of took the collimation and made it all black. It's still there. Oh, this is our image with at three days. Cool. All right. Resizing. We sometimes do this. Uh, mostly not for us, more for radiologists to kind of see within an area. Just recognize that when you zoom in, uh, you are going to lose some spatial resolution. Right, image gets uh, a little bit blurrier, but bigger, right? Um, and again, it, it may allow a radiologist to kind of like see something that they might not have seen, and then of course from there they can go back and reduce the size, but you know keeping that region of interest in mind, uh, and then might help them pinpoint something that they couldn't have seen, perhaps, right? Uh, the other thing to keep in mind, it's somewhat related to this, is the size of the CR cassette that you utilize. You shouldn't just pick any cassette, whichever one's handy. And of course, it's not like you're wasting film, so you might, you know, a hand will fit on a 10 by 12 as easy as it'll fit on a 1417, and you can still collimate, but when the plate is red, uh, if you do an object on a larger cassette size, it will miniaturize and get smaller, right? Which is why essentially you should still use a 10 by 12 cassette size if you're doing a hand, right? It's not about the film. It's about how it's being processed and its relationship to the magnification. A 10 by 12 digital CR cassette should give you the approximate same size as the object itself. And will also give you the same size as what was once utilized when you used a 10 by 12 film cassette. We can do a lab within the lab. Who, who wants to volunteer? I need two quick images of a hand, one on a 1417, one on a 10 by 12, and then display them side by side. Go for it. Oh yeah, you could each do one. That'll, that'll make it even faster. Someone use a 10 by 12 and someone use a 1417 though. Oh. Does it matter C or D or? Yeah. They both be. Oh, it, it doesn't matter. Because we're looking at size. Even the technique doesn't really matter for this one. Uh, so they only use 1417s? They don't have 10 by 12s? Oh, 7 by 17. DR. So recognize, though, in DR, you still column it. So DR is different than CR, 
right? The image size will change, which is why you should collimate down to the size of the hand. Because if you leave it, if you if you leave it open, so we can do that here because we have a DR room. That, that's another lab within the lab. Is we can do the same hand, one with the collimation open all the way, one with it closed. Or right, right. But if you don't, um, the magnification will change. In addition to radiation exposure, right? That's a separate topic, but of course it's related. DR. That's right. If you use, if you collimate, uh, in other words, reduce the field size, then that will reduce the amount of magnification. Now, let me say that a different way. If you collimate, it should not get miniaturized. Right. My guess is, so you want to do this one? Is our room open? Someone shoot a, a hand in there, in, in room one, right? No, no volunteers? Okay, so you're gonna shoot a hand, uh, use the same technique on everything. The only difference is one you collimate, you know, nice and tight, uh, and the other one you leave it pretty much open. <laughs> so, while they're going, I'll just keep, or you, you wanna help? I don't know. <laughs> oh, good. Our labs are starting. All right. How about image stitching? Anyone see this before? Um, scoliosis. What did, what did you see? Scoliosis. But how was it done? Big cassette or no cassette? So you split it in half or you do one side and then flip it and do the other side? Yeah, I've seen that before. Yeah, that one and the starting one, it's Okay. So when we did this screen film, um, we took this big thing into the into the dark room um, and ran it all in one piece. Uh, now you have software that stitches uh, them together. Um, yeah, well, here you can actually see the seams, but they're not seams that are physical. They're, they're digital where the stitching occurred. Uh, and that's getting better. Usually they look seamless now, and you don't see that because it's an artifact. Um, they have some really sophisticated equipment now where the, the tube moves down um, and somehow accounts for the central ray not always being in the same place. Uh, to, to help reduce the distortion uh, that we've talked about all of last year. Uh, HSS has a uh, two sets of tubes that go down the patient 90 degrees apart from each other and get AP and lateral at the same time. Pretty nifty. Uh, I forgot to mention that um, maybe I'll put an email out. Uh, Wednesday, I'd like you to come in with where you think your second clinical site's going to be. Yeah. So I'll, I'll send you the, the choices. It's everything that you had before minus Mount Sinai West. So my Mount Sinai West is gone, uh, plus Woodhull, plus HSS. And minus whatever you're in now. Can't go. No, you can't go to the same place twice. <laughs> as much as you might like it or not like it. So that's. Should pop up in a second. How are we doing over here? Trouble with this. You're still in schedule, so eventually you have to be in acquisition to take the image. 
Okay, so how are we doing on time? We don't have that much time. So kind of to wrap up, just a few more things. Sort of your book has these eight essential criteria. I wouldn't say this is like a, a, a radiology thing that everyone knows what the eight essential criteria are. So I'm not going to go too crazy with this. And most of them are self-explanatory, even though they're spelled out a little bit further in the subsequent slides. But, you know, pixel brightness levels, right? They can't be either black or white, right? They should be in between some type of grayscale. Image contrast and grayscale, right? Um, should give you a baseline medium contrast image uh, that can then be adjusted to make it shorter, more high contrast, or longer, more low contrast. Um, that's what the system should do for us. We shouldn't really have to window too much. You know, the idea is that it works the way it should. But as we know, that's not always the case. Maximum signal to noise ratio. Uh, that's really what we want all the time. And that's usually achieved with the proper exposure setting, right? If we have enough KV to penetrate the part, um, if we're using enough intensity, we should be able to provide the detectors with um, as much data as they need. And we can look at that data as signal. So the idea is we're going to have more signal, more data versus noise. At least that's what we try. Um, maximum spatial resolution would be nice, right? Okay, so let's see. Hold on a second. I'm talking to myself now. All right. Excellent. Do you guys see the same hand? Can you see that they're a different size? Right. Um, so what happened here is... We collimated tighter, and it got smaller. I was actually expecting the other way around. Oh, no, that's not true. Did we collimate the same? Yeah, the only I didn't touch it. He set up the So the, oh, okay, you did it in the same room? Same room. Same room. You had the same collimation? Same collimation, same technique. Okay, so... So this one was the 1417? The one where the markers by the wrist is the 1417. Okay, good. So, so I'm, I'm happy. So yes, when you use the larger size cassette, you get a mini miniature image. Okay, yay. That's why it's lab within the lab. That was a real lab. Done. No portables today? So portables next week, and then the following week, again, portables. And then whatever the week is after that, and there might be a break, I can't remember which group that was. Uh, then next week. So fun with portables for the next few weeks. So maximum spatial resolution, um, somewhere around eight line pairs per millimeter. Uh, be aware that fluoroscopic images are usually not as good, right? So when we say not as good, when the number of light pairs per millimeter goes down, uh, your spatial resolution goes down. Does focal spot have a role to play? It's minimal, but it does have a role. I think we did a lab, one of the first labs we did uh, was looking at the spatial resolution tool when we flipped between the large and the small focal spot. And you really have to look closely to see the difference. You know, if you were to do that with an actual anatomical part, could you really tell? Probably not so much. Oh, you're done. Okay. Hold on. Let's see. Ah, uh, seems much bigger. Okay. So, same thing happens here. Can you guys see the this? I don't know, can you guys, I don't know, can you guys see? So what's that one? That's this is no, collimation. no collimation, looks pretty small. 
When you collimate, it looks much bigger. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So whether you're using CR or whether you're using DR, the rule is collimate to the size of the part, right, without cutting anything. <clears throat> Absence of artifacts, we talked about this earlier. Um, I guess you got to be on the lookout for the, for the underwear pockets now, but um, yeah. Uh, people have all sorts of, and think there are certain things that don't come out, right? Uh, you know, so piercings don't generally come out easily. Um, those are things you need to annotate and let let um, radiologists know, right? Um, but yeah, during your careers, you'll you'll see all sorts of artifacts that you never thought of, right? I, your guys are lucky; they don't have to do as many skull X-rays. Because I remember people coming in with all sorts of pins and bobby pins and a million different things, and all of that had to come out. Earrings were the easiest part, right? <clears throat> Still have to worry about earrings when it comes to C spine, though. Yeah. For sure. And glasses. Right. Don't want those in. What about a cochlear implant? Cochlear implant. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's okay. It can't can't come out. Maybe a microphone part, but you know the part that's that's built in that's been surgically placed into the patient. You can't do anything. Uh, size shape distortion. Uh, this is something we can do something about. Now, if the person gets hit by a truck, uh, maybe it's not so easy to get the part parallel to the image receptor as much as you'd like. If, if they're just stuck like this, there's only so much you can do. You can't snap people into place, not Legos. But um, as much as possible, right, we only, you know, put an angle on the tube when we want to remove superimposition uh, and see our anatomy better, right? Uh, but we shouldn't be angling if we don't need to. My time almost done. Uh, geometric magnification. Um, well, when you're in the room, Usually you're set, right? You know, it locks in at 40 or it locks in at 72. Uh, but when you're doing stretcher cases or when you're doing something that's, you know, in the emergency room and for some reason you have uh, more OID, we saw that on the midterm, OID is really the enemy, right? Five inches of OID will really change your magnification. Five inches of SID, not so much, probably not noticeable, right? Um, but if you are going to have OID, again, you want to annotate your image because radiologist doesn't know that in order for you to get your cassette, you know, close up to the patient, you had to put a sponge in some direction, you know, to make it work. All they see, and you're not used to this, is all they see is images, right? You know, it doesn't occur that often, maybe in fluoro. Uh, outside of that, though, they don't see the patient very often. Uh, display. These should pretty much be set for you, right? Um, the, the, you really shouldn't mess with the monitors, right? Um, occasionally, I don't know how often, um, all of the equipment in terms of the, the plate reader and the monitor, uh, they, they go through some QC tests. Um, fairly often, though, uh, people come in and they, they vacuum inside and they clean things and and they do what's known as PM. Have you heard that term, PM? Preventative maintenance. You do PM on your cars, right? Before the red lights go on, <laughs> so that they don't go on. Uh, last but not least, uh, a couple of sections here. Uh, some of the terms have changed. Uh, you can get this reprinted from the ARRT uh, guidelines, but uh, brightness, uh, and density, um, film-based were mass would control your density. It's low. It's no longer mass, right? It's our, our brightness and overall density are being rescaled based on lookup tables and histograms. Our grayscale slash contrast used to be controlled by KV. Now KV is just penetrating the part it has been replaced by lookup tables. Our sharpness, which used to be all about large or small focal spot, even though this still exists, is largely a component now of pixel size and field of view and matrix, right? Remember, it's 
the focal spot really is the limiting factor, unfortunately. Uh, but a lot of our sharpness, otherwise known as spatial resolution, is based on uh, our matrix size. Magnification uh, is related to SID and SOD, and still kind of is. So this should be kind of in both of these uh, columns, if you ask me. But in addition to SID and SOD, we've now seen with our two mini labs today uh, that uh, matrix size in terms of uh, how the computer analyzes the image based on the collimation or the or the size of the cassette will have a lot to do with whether the image magnified or not. And the one that stays the same is shape distortion is all about the alignment, whether it is the tube being angled, the part being ang angled, or the image receptor being angled. <sighs> so I conclude now. Uh, I've done this three times now, just one more time to go. All right, so enjoy, and I'll see you guys next week for some, next week we won't just all sit here, we'll be able to get up and play with the portables that you haven't seen or used in a while. This table, like, what do you um, 